Can we stand and worship? Your faithfulness has walked beside me. He sees it from where I'm standing. I see the evidence of your goodness. You're all over my life. You're all over my life. remember help me remember when I'm weak yeah. that fear may come and fear will leave you lead my heart to victory yeah. you are my strength and you are Somebody give the Lord a shout of praise this morning, would you? You see, Restore, we're celebrating six years as a church. Today is a special day at Restore. And you know, we're also wrapping up 21 days of prayer and time, and now they left, they transferred. Maybe life drew them in a different direction. But you're praying for them. And we've also been praying for healing. We've been praying for cancer and broken bodies that needed to be healed, right? We're praying for family and friends. And just because we've reached the end of 21 days of prayer and fasting doesn't mean that we're done praying and fasting, right? So if you need a little bit of encouragement this morning because maybe that prayer that you were praying hadn't been answered yet or maybe not the way that you wanted it answered, God's still working. He's still working in the background. And just like he said in Matthew 17, 20, he said, because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith, the grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there. 
and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. You see, those people that you've been praying for for 21 days, they need that faith the size of that mustard seed this morning. They need you to keep praying for them because you're going to battle for them. You don't give up. God has moved in this church. I've seen prayers answered not just in the last 21 days, but in the last six years. And man, I, I can't wait to see what God has planned for Restore. So I don't know about you, but I'm happy. But this next song is, it's talking about prayers. It's talking about seeing cancer being healed. It's talking about bodies being healed, right? It's talking about families being restored. It's talking about the loss being redeemed. That's what this next song says. So if you would join me this morning, we're gonna sing this song. Working God, and you heal me, 
sing another song here in just a second and I just want to go ahead and warn you if you want to get excited this next song is going to be your chance because when Pastor Mark comes up he's going to talk and you guys don't get to talk and celebrate anymore I'm just kidding I'm just kidding but look don't you tell me God can't do it because six years ago six years ago a day before today or tomorrow six years tomorrow I was sitting in my house saying God I don't think this is going to work I don't think we're gonna be able to do it. Why Portsmouth? Portsmouth is the poorest city in Hampton Roads. Why are we doing this, God? Why We may have made a mistake. Don't you tell me God can't do it. Because if it was not for God, we would not have the families that we have here today. We would not have the individuals that we have here today. We would not have the life change that has taken place in this church today. Don't you tell me my God can't do it. This is not my time, but I do want to point out, man, I look around and I see some familiar faces that have moved away and they've gone to serve in other churches. They've moved away because of military, they've moved away for whatever the reason is, and they are here to celebrate with us this morning. We have family members celebrating with us this morning. And this morning, I get to introduce to some of you, not, not all of you, but some of you, our first worship leader, Travis. To. So if y'all know Travis, he's like, yeah, what? And I had to do the slides in the back, and that was before we had, like, the, and, man, he'd be like, all right, now we're going to go over here. And I'm like, where are we? Right? But Travis has moved to North Carolina. Travis is serving in a church in North Carolina. The families that are here today, they are serving in churches, and, and we want to be very clear. There's going to be a point where some of you are going to be called away for jobs for other reasons. And that's fine. You have our blessing. But don't leave bitter at us. Don't leave bitter at what a human did to you. Please allow God to use your gifts and find a place to get tied in no matter where you go. And so, Travis, I'm going to give you your microphone back, and we're going to turn it over to you, and you tell us what you're doing and lead us into our final song. I love Kev. Can we just honor Kev right now? My nickname for him is Kev Mo. I have no clue where it came from. I just made it up. Um, uh, I'm just an ordinary guy. I, I call myself the ministry hippie. Um, I had a, it was a little handful of us when we first started here, and I was one of those people. I was honored to be uh, brought on by Pastor Mark, who is super dope, and his new balances today. If y'all haven't seen him, his new balances are dripping. He is dripping right now. Um, I had the, <laughs> I had the honor to join them, uh, and it, and God just grew that thing. And I could truly say that I'm about as smart as a box of rocks. So when I tell you God is great, when he uses me, he is great. And everyone around me that he uses, it makes him even greater. When you could look at somebody else and see what God done in their life through you, you give them that more praise. Because it's just not, it's not just us with community, right? It's gospel. This is kingdom. So it, your joy is my joy. We get lit. You got a praise, we're turning up. And so um, after a few years in, uh, I decided and I felt led to go to North Carolina uh, on a musical journey as a recording artist, a kingdom recording artist. Uh, and God's just been opening doors since I moved there um, in major ways and also having the joy to serve at... Um, uh, First Church over there in Gaston, uh, North, Gastonia, North Carolina, which I also got my, me brother here and somewhere in here, I'm not going to point him out, but uh, we work hand in hand together. We tear stuff up over there. Um, but it's been a joy uh, and I'm just, I'm grateful to come back and just see everybody. Y'all all still look like Gap models. Um, and we, 
We just gonna we just gonna worship God as Gap models. That's what, if it's okay with y'all. I see fedoras and everything. This is gonna be a good Sunday. <laughs> Jesus is real. Uh, can 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 I get, can I just do something? I, I would love to pray. I, I don't want to keep it on me. I'm just the guy that left and came back to visit. Uh, <laughs> but I just want to pray because I feel like God is doing the most things right now because of COVID. You ever think about how uncomfortable you feel at times? But do we ever think about how quick we don't stop and acknowledge God in the uncomfortable? Because so many times he's like, I just want you to get comfortable. One time with the uncomfortable, and then your vision will change. Your scenery changes. People look different. Because they exist, you just love them. doesn't matter what their lifestyle is, skin color. That, it doesn't matter. Because they exist, because they're a person, I can love them. Because I'm honored with the privilege to do that. Honored to do that. So I just want to encourage you this morning let you know you are an amazing thing. Your mind, how you feel, all that you are. God loves that because he designed that. And when you're afraid and you feel broken, when you're down to your last rope, that's where God, he meets you there. He says, I need them to go a little bit lower so I can tell them I get in the dirt too. He gets in the dirt too. He rode in it. He rose from it. So I just want to encourage you this morning that you walk in power when you call the name Jesus. The stone is rolled away. You can be free. You can be free, baby. Let's pray. God, I love you so much. I'm so thankful for Pastor Mark and his family. I'm thankful for the worship team. I'm thankful for every heart in this room. God, I th I'm, I'm thankful that you allow us to exist to know you more. Because over that fence is something beautiful. God, just help us to see the fence in the first place and not turn with our backs towards it thinking this is it. Help us to rise up and do a 180 and see the sunset that you left for us. You are still real. You are still beautiful. You're still moving. You're still working. You weren't a movie that began and ended, God. You're a sequel and a trilogy and everything after that. Fill this room, God. Make us feel like we removed our shoes. Give us a Moses experience. Give us some wisdom like Solomon. Give us some courage like David. God, give us the heart of you. And let us be able to just breathe and know that it's okay right where we stand because this is a hospital and a safe haven and not a temple for perfect people. So we give you glory for what's about to happen today. We thank you for the celebration. We thank you for all that you're doing and all that you're going to do when we even leave this building, God. I declare it in your sweet and precious name that there will be victory. There will be prosperity in your name, in the kingdom things, that families will be brought back. God, that hearts will be mended, that that forgiveness can be left in the suitcase at the altar, God, that we can leave free, free. And when the sun sets free, oh boy, they're free indeed. So we give you glory. Before this next song, we give you glory before our next breath. And before the rocks cry out, God, we were going to worship you with everything that we have. And it doesn't have to be a clapped hand, Father. You said, with our hearts. So the person that has his hands in his pocket has just as much as a chance as the person that's jumping up and down. And we give you glory for that because the ground is level at the foot of the cross. We love you so much. You're beautiful, God. Thank you for the opportunity to breathe in your presence. In Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm excited. Amen. Can we give God a praise? Yeah. Let's worship. Just want to lift you up, Father. I was buried beneath my shame. But who? Who could carry that car? away it was it was my tomb till I was breathing but not alive but we coming alive today all my failures I try to hide it was my tomb till, 
till I met you. Oh, this is my part. I love this. I don't know about you. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. Yes, I did. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. That is when you call. You called my name and I and I ran out. Darkness into, into your glorious day. Yeah. God, you're great. Oh, you're great. Now your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. Hey, yo. The old may know Jesus when I met you. Yeah, that's when you called my name and I ran out of that grave. I'm alive, I'm alive. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. Come on, say you called my name. I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day Glorious, glorious I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of hell. Yeah. When I was broken, you were my healing, now your love is the end I have. I have a future, my eyes are open. My name, I ran out of that grave. How does the dark dawn to your glory is day? I'm free, I'm free. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave. How does the darkness? Into your glorious day. Hey, come down, Abba, come down, Abba. Oh, oh, oh you're wonderful, wonderful. All right. While we were singing that song, my kids leaned over to me and they said, Dad, look who it is. A couple weeks ago, we were praying for a little baby who had some complications. Dustin and Destiny is this baby's parents. And as we were singing that song, guess who walked down the aisle? In the car seat. The baby's sleeping. Shh. We're so thankful you guys are here. We've been praying. First time I heard that song, and I'm sorry, guys, it's been six years, so I got a lot to say right now, and I'm going to try to keep it down. I remember the first time I heard that song, we were at a conference. We were kind of beat down at the time. It was, COVID was going on, and we were trying to figure out what it meant to, to worship, really. And to, to be in church. And somebody started singing this song, and I was sitting there just going through my mind, all the problems. And they came to the part and said, and I ran out of that grave. Got my attention. There's nothing else better. We were created for one purpose. 
We're not guaranteed a life of ease. We're guaranteed a hope. Let me welcome you here this morning. If you're here this morning, you're like, man, what's going on? <laughs> this is our six-year anniversary as a church. And we weren't sure what the weather was going to do, and we made the call for one service today. And let me just say, if you're in life track, we will reconvene next week. You will get emails this week about that. But our leader said, we're focusing on one thing today. We're going to celebrate, and today's going to be a celebration. So, so life track, we apologize. Weather messed us up, but it's okay because we're going to have fun today. If you're watching online, we welcome you. If you're a guest with us today, we're going to invite you as we do every week. There's a Connect card in the seat back in front of you. And if you will fill out that Connect card with your name and your information and, and mark that you're a first-time guest, drop it in the buckets on the way out the doors this morning, or you can do it online. Uh, just by doing so, we will make a donation on your behalf to the amount of 10 meals to a local organization. So that's how you can make a difference. If you're here today and you want to make a difference, uh, you can also check in on Facebook. All that information is on, is on the screen. But today, the main thing we're focusing on is our anniversary. It's our anniversary. As you, I'm sorry, I'm a crier. I don't know if y'all got that, but, and a big, ugly dude crying ain't no good. Shut up, Terry. <laughs> y'all didn't hear what he just said. But before I, before I talk about the balloons outside, uh, we've got an individual, I think she's in here. Kendall, are you in here? Kendall, come on, come on, come on. Everybody's standing so they can't see you, so you got to come up on stage. This is, this is Kendall. Kendall serves in our nursery toddler uh, team. Uh, and Kendall was actually told to come in this morning and joke on my, the white hair on my beard, and she refused to do so. So I have a special place in my heart for Kendall. Not the person who said to do so. But I want to point this out. Every Sunday, we have about 100 individuals who come in and they serve faithfully all over the building. We have people that come in early to set things, just who come in and they're ready to watch kids, not because we don't want kids in service, but because we know kids can be a distraction, but they can learn about God in an environment where they're loved. And Kendall gives up her time. It's not what the, it's, we're thankful for the launch team, but it's not what the launch team. We're thankful for all these things. Six year celebration. It was your birthday. We're celebrating your birthday. So thank you. And that's going to bring me to the balloons outside. When y'all walked in, you saw a I tried. But there's about 260 balloons out there. And if you think about it for a second, I'm sure you can figure out what those balloons represent. I even had the idea of bringing them in. They told me it would be dumb, and they'd pop and everything, so we didn't do that. But all my ideas are dumb. But I do like to celebrate because every single one of those balloons represents a soul, an individual that has given their life to Christ. Their life has been changed as a result of Restore Church. And not the building, as a result of you. Because it is proven time and time again that people's lives are changed not by a big extravagant fair that we put on, a big extravagant event that we do, but because somebody stepped in and said, what's going on in your life? Can I share with you how God's changed my life? So church, we celebrate you this morning. And those balloons out there, those are a representation of souls that will not be eternally separated from God and families that will be changed and, and transformed. And we are thankful for that. Thank you. Guys, you can be seated because we got, we got several other things we're going to go through <clears throat> real quick. Many of you don't know this, but... Uh, Pastor Mark, Terry, sit down, man. Got to get a good camera shot. I had three kids at the time. I used to go and plant a church. And one of the things that we would share when we, when we were sharing the information about Portsmouth, Virginia, we would share in our presentation, uh, Portsmouth, Virginia is the number, at the time, was the number one unsafest city per capita in the state of Virginia. And that, that tugged at heartstrings, but at the same time, I'm moving my family to this city right? 
But over the time, we had about 100 churches, and there's going to be a map that pops up here that shows you churches all over the country that supported so that we could start this church. And this doesn't represent church buildings putting us in their budget. This represents thousands of individuals saying, I'll give $10 a month, I'll give $20 a month, I'll give $50 a month. And it came in from all over the country so that we could start Restore Church. And today we're also celebrating because that support that you see up there gets to be transitioned into another church start because we are our own church now. I know I'm sharing a lot of stuff, guys. I know I am. But it's a celebration. I'm thankful for all those who partnered with us, who heard the stories. And, and we, we had a lot of conversations having three young kids who were like, are you sure? And I was like, no, really, but we're going to do it. <laughs> you have given and how you have sacrificed. And guys, there are families who they gave up. We're going to pray for the next season because we always want to celebrate the landmarks. We always want to remember what God has done, but at the same time, we don't want to always focus on the past. We want to celebrate it. We want to remember what God has done because we need that encouragement to carry us through the hard times that are going to come. And so we're going to pray for that. But if you're a guest here this morning, I have a few things that we want to make you aware of. If you want to find out more about our church, next Sunday we will be starting Life Track. That is our next step series. It's a four Sunday series. You can find out more information by uh, filling out your Connect card. Uh, you'll get emails with that information. We won't spend a lot of time on it. But you can become a part of our church. You can become a part of the team that Kindle is a part of and serving others and using the gifts that God's given you by joining LifeTrack. If you're here this morning and you have not joined a small group, we, we just relaunched those. I'm going to go ahead and brag on the men's group because the parking lot and sidewalks this morning, that's a result of Saturday morning men's group. Yeah, that's right. That's right. A couple weeks ago, Pastor Mark was talking about how they had more men in their group on Monday night. But I asked our men yesterday, I said, y'all see any of those Monday night group members here? <laughs> that's right, because the men are on Saturdays. But if you're not a part of a group, man, become a part of a group. Because this is great, but if we're truly going to grow in Christ, we've got to become intimate with other believers. We've got to get into a smaller setting so that we can share what's really going on in our life. Take that mask off and not be judged. So join a group. You can do that at restore.church slash groups. We leave every month at 7 o'clock in the evening. We come in and we have a celebration. We have a Bible study. We take communion. We've had individuals say, I don't think I've ever been a part of communion. You've never been to First Wednesday. We do it every single day. So I'm going to pray now. And as I do, we're going to pray for the future of our church. And I love that I get to say our church. And I know it's popcorn. I know it's up and down, up and down. But I knew I was going to talk for a while. So I'm, I'm going to invite you, if you will, to stand with me again. And we're going to pray together. And if you feel led, I would invite you to, to raise your hands. And let's say some of the families that some of you represent here today, some of the loss, hurt, struggles, whatever it is, we are praying for the future. And God, we come to you today. God, we celebrate. We are so thankful. We are so excited. God, we have sung. We, and it was a result of someone telling that person about you. But God, don't let us become okay with where we're at. God, may we be reminded about the day that we ran out of that grave. The day that we realized that you had given us forgiveness of our sins. And God may not say, I'm surrounded by people who just pull me down. But God, let us look around and say, I'm surrounded by people that God can pull up. Give us that ability. Give us that wisdom. Give us those words. God, when we get into a situation that we are up, addictions overcome, healing happen, but God, families restored. And God, we'll give you the praise. We will give you the glory. 
God, we thank you next 60 years. And while some of us may not be around in 60 years, and God, I hope I'm not, following to take the mantle and lead this church, don't let us ever look down on somebody for their age or their ability because, God, you don't look for the, the smartest. You don't look for the person that has all the answer that is put together. God, you look for the willing. On a warm Sunday in January, that first service ran out of chairs. More than 50 people made the decision to trust in Jesus at Restore. Serve teams were formed as leaders were identified and equipped. As the church grew, new small groups began meeting as more people made Restore their home. In 2017, God opened the door for the church to purchase a facility right around the corner from its meeting location. Over the course of 120 days, an old warehouse was transformed into a church building. 19. Restore was holding two services every Sunday and had welcomed hundreds of people into the church. Of course, 2020 changed some things, but it didn't change what mattered most. Whether meeting online, under a tent, or indoors under mask mandates, the church continued to welcome new people. Restore has more serve teams, small groups, and leaders than ever before. When God builds his church, nothing, not even a global pandemic, can stop. We celebrate the community God is building. We celebrate the opportunities we have to serve our city. We don't just celebrate though. As we celebrate, we also prepare for what the corner we believe the best is yet to come. I don't know if you caught that last part, but our church has never had as many leaders as we have right now. We've never had this many small groups. And Kevin said it, we've got more men in small groups than we've ever had. And I'm honored to be a part of this church and watch you lead and you love and you share the gospel and I do believe that the best is yet to come. I do believe that we are just on the front lines of what God is doing. Because if we aren't careful, we look around and we say, God, I've been doing this for a year. Why isn't anything changing? God, I've been going to group for six months. Why isn't my life all put together? God, I've been a Christian roots and to make a lasting impact and difference. And I'm going to mention something. Um, there was that map up there. There are some churches that I just feel obligated and really indebted to and I love that I want to mention by name. I can't mention all 100 churches. I don't have that kind of memory. But I do want to mention a couple of those churches. So if they'll throw that map up on the screen, uh, I want to thank Gateway Church over in Virginia Beach. I grew up there. They taught me the gospel, taught me how to love people. Pastor Kevin's dad was on staff there. They're one of those 100 churches that support us. I want to thank with, and I've known for more than 30 years of my life. They took up a big offering this Christmas, and they're going to put their offering toward our upstairs renovation. They, they are that generous, and they love what we're doing, and they love what God is doing here. I want to thank churches like uh, Faith in Chandler, Indiana, uh, First Church in Gastonia, and Travis is serving at First Church in Gastonia. My brother-in-law is on staff there. He's in the because that's the kind of pastor that he is. He loves other pastors, and he knows that sometimes even in the midst of celebration, there can be frustration and hurt and pain and loss. I want to thank New Hope Church in Tennessee, uh, Cramerton Church in North Carolina, Fort Gibson Church in Oklahoma, uh, Connect Church in Cal Bakersfield, California, the Heritage Church in Ohio, Mountain View Church in Arizona, and the list goes on and on and on. Others, they put us in the budget for crazy amounts of money, thousands of dollars a month when we were first starting so that we could get off the ground, get into a building. We're so grateful for that level of generosity. And guys, we don't just thank them. We do the same. Our church today supports literally dozens of church planters at generous levels and mission a living legacy, a strong legacy, like our series that we're continuing this morning. You've got to have a strong foundation. So this morning, we get to build on the foundation that those churches gave toward, and now we get to move forward and create that legacy. So if you have your Bible, I'm going to invite you to turn to 2 Timothy. We're going to continue our series called Living Message this morning that really illustrates what it looks like for you and for me to be a part of a church that God uses. 
Because here's the truth. We're not just celebrating a building or the church. We're celebrating you and what God is doing in you. And so this morning, more than this church needs a legacy, this church needs to be filled with people who are living out their legacy day in and day out. Verses 42 through 47. Every anniversary, every time our church turns another year old, every time from the day that our church launched, the first message I preached at this church, I will always read Acts. And we love the Lord and the church is on fire for God. In Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, big gatherings, Sunday worship services, as it were, to the breaking of bread and prayers in small groups. And all came upon every soul, every soul thing, and sharing the gospel. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. Most of you know last year, you gave more than any other year. Your generosity continues to increase as we love the to all as any had need. You should know this if you are in our church, if you're a part of this church and you have need. We have incredible leaders in this church who serve on the benevolence team. I'm not a part of it. People who who will talk with you, counsel you, help you. And yes, we support people financially when those needs come up. Why? Because God's people need to do more than just provide food for people we don't know. We need to provide for the needs of those in the house. The next verse says day by day, every day, not just Sunday. They were attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes. This is the idea of small groups. And they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Y'all, they were living a simple but good life, praising God and having favor with all the people. This is what every church wants. Every church wants verse 47, but most of us don't live out 42 through 46. Praising God, having favor with all the people. How come culture doesn't like the church? Because we're not living like the church. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Y'all, I'm not talking about a few or a handful. Thousands, tens of thousands, turns into millions. And today, billions claim the name of Jesus. Our church is growing. Churches around the world are growing. I know that it's been a tough two years. But understand this. All around the world, Jesus' church continues to thrive and grow when we love people like we're called to. When we serve God, we're faithful to his teaching. We're faithful to his people can't stop what God is doing. So how do we do that, Pastor Mark? I want to share with you a very simple four-step plan that God put in Acts chapter 2. I'm sorry, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, as we've been going verse by verse. And Paul laid out for Timothy what it looks like to be a person that God uses. Because here's the truth. Everybody in the, in the room is like, hey, Pastor Mark, I want our church to be used by God. Great. Don't pray God use our church. Pray God use me. Stop it, y'all. Stop saying, God, I wish you would, and say, God, how could you use me to do it? Stop praying for God. God, I wish you would save this person. Have you shared the gospel with them? God, I wish you would reach out and encourage this person. Well, have you picked up the phone and texted them? I mean, we're talking easy stuff now, real simple. Stuff we'll regret not doing for eternity if we don't do it before we end life here. So my question this morning is not, hey, how can our church do this? It's how can I as an individual be someone God uses? Because the truth is this. We don't need hundreds. All we need is about a dozen people that God truly uses in a powerful and impactful way. And you, would, you wouldn't believe what God could do with about a dozen people. You wouldn't believe what God could do with about 70 men and women, 120 men and women who will meet together and pray in an upper room. You wouldn't believe how he could turn history upside down. So this morning, I'm not asking you to like, hey, I'll, I'll do that. I'm saying, if you want to be committed, it only takes about a handful. If you really want to be a part of what God is doing. Read with me in 2 Timothy. Chapter 2, we're going to pick up where we left off last week, verse 14. Remind them of these things. We need to be in remembrance. Remember and charge them before God not to quarrel about words. Well, Pastor Mark, I thought you were going to tell us what to do. Yeah, I'm going to tell you what to do. Here's the problem. We don't have time to do it because we're busy doing this. <laughs> not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. He says, don't do that. Don't get caught up in that. Have you ever met a Christian who every time they disagree with you on the tiniest of things, they tell you, you're not a Christian? Every time somebody in their church doesn't dress like them, act like them, talk like them, vote like them, think like them, raise their kids like them, they're like, oh, I don't know, I don't know if you're really what the Lord has in mind. You might run into Christians like that. You have not walked into a church like that. We don't have time for that. The big things matter around here. I'm going to tell you who Jesus is. I'm going to tell you, you need to read God's word. You need to know God's word. But if you want me to get in the, in the pit and argue with you about every little word and every little doctrine and every little thing, I'm telling you, you've got freedom to disagree with me about charismatic and tongues. You've got freedom to disagree with me about music or about style or about clothes. Guys, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not in on that. I'm not in that culture war. I'm not in that Christian culture war. I'm not involved in any of that. I got ideas about politics. You don't need to hear them. It don't matter. 
You think a thousand years from now, people are like, I wonder what Pastor Mark had to say. I want to talk to you about things that are eternal and are going to matter 50 years from now, 100 years from now, 10,000 years from now. We don't have time. But a lot of us are like, Pastor Mark, why am I not making a difference in the world? I've seen your Facebook. All you really want to let people know is what you think about everything happening right this second. And you don't actually think about, hey, how could I impact somebody's life that'll matter a million years from now in eternity? You're getting them on your side about how you think and how you vote and what you think about this issue or that issue, and you're always up to date on the latest issues, and you can, de- you can define every term. You know what woke means. You know what CRT means. You know, you know why the conservatives are really stupid. You know why the liberals are really stupid. But at the end of the day, you wonder why no one listens to you. You wonder why other Christians don't really want to hear from you. It's because you've added stumbling blocks, brother. You've added stumbling blocks to the greatest stumbling block. I'm not going to get up here and add myself to this conflict or that conflict. i gotta, I got to deal with the greatest conflict in human history. i got to tell people that they have to humble themselves and repent. Jesus is the stumbling block. He doesn't need extras. That's a big stumbling block. So let's stop adding to it. Let's stop telling people, you got to like my kind of music if you're going to come to my church. Whatever, y'all. If you want to be that Christian, look, you can. Paul says that's a waste of time. It actually hurts the hearer. And a whole lot of us have hurt the gospel by equating every cultural difference to a gospel issue. You know, I can't believe they're sending their kids to public school. I can't believe they're homeschooling their kids. I can't believe they're sending their kids to a Christian school. Don't they know they should be salt and light? And we just, we argue and divide over every little thing. We wonder why nobody hears the gospel. It's because we're not talking the gospel anymore. It's not what we talk about. It's not what we post. It's not what we share. Man, Pastor Mark, I thought today was a celebration. (laughs) If you don't mind preaching at people outside these walls so we can celebrate what God has done inside these walls, the rest of us would really like that right now. I hear you. I hear you. Keep moving. Keep moving. Verse 15 says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling. This is the idea that the language here really references the Old Testament where priests would cut up the offering meat. They would, they would cut up the offerings as it were and they would, they would make sure it was dispersed properly. They were, they were good at handling the offering uh, before God in the worship service. And who is no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. It's important that you and I know how to handle God's word. You know, a lot of Christians don't know how to handle this and they hurt people. You ever been around somebody that doesn't know how to handle the thing in their hand? I got a one-year-old, and when we feed him his meal, uh, Pastor Mark is not, I'm a good dad. Don't get me, maybe I'm not. I don't know. I, <laughs> jury's still out. We're new to this. I'm feeding him breakfast one morning. Mom's not there. Rarely am I in charge, but I'm in charge, and so I'm trying to get him breakfast, and I'm cutting up the strawberries, and I got to cut them just right, and I'm so caught up in cutting the strawberries just right, you know what I left within arm's reach? That knife. <laughs> Thank Lord it was a paring knife, not super sharp. I don't know. I turn around. He's got it, and he ain't holding it by the handle. I said, Jesus, stop time. (laughs) Let me get to that, because I'm three steps away. Let me get to that hand before he squeezes. He don't know how to handle that. There's a whole bunch of us. You want to know why we don't know how to handle the Bible? Because we're still immature little babies coming to church. Now, my son is a one-year-old, so he's grown a little bit. But you know what a lot of us are? We've been in church 20 years, but we're still walking around like one-year-olds. We don't know how to read the word. We don't know how to, we don't know how to study the word. We don't know what words mean. We, we don't spend any time. So we're just like, oh, that's for somebody else. You're going to live your life as a Christian, as an infant, making a mess, poopy diaper, smelly, bad. People don't want to be around you. So learn how to handle the word. All right, and then verse 16. I'm going to come back to these. I'm not just leaving it. But if arguments, avoid bad teaching word. Any old preacher, this preacher included, could get up in front of you and say, this is what God's word said. And if you don't know God's word, you're going you're gonna to eat it. You're going to believe it. You're going to swallow it. You're going to take it and run with it. And that's not good for you. So I want you to hear me say this. You need to know God's word so you can check up on what I tell you. You need to know God's word so that guy selling something late at night on TV don't sell you a seed offering that you never see come back. Oh, it'll be planted in his ministry, his nonprofit his house. We live in a world where that stuff goes on. Look, y'all, I've I've heard a lot of good messages. I've watched a lot of late night sermons on TV. You know what I'm talking about? I know when I'm being moved and manipulated, and I know when God is speaking. You want to know why? Because I know God's word. So I give to ministries. I give to missions. I give to church planting. 
I don't give to somebody's platform. I ain't here to make somebody famous. I'm not here to help somebody else just get rich off of the gospel. It's wicked. But you don't know the difference if you don't know the Bible. Keep reading, keep reading. It gets better. It gets better. <laughs> not only that, their talk will spread. Their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus. These guys left the gospel preaching ministry, notice this, who have swerved from the truth. you got to know what you're listening to. Bad preaching, bad teaching to get you in trouble. They swerve from the truth. Saying that the resurrection has already happened, they are upsetting the faith of some. Right now we live in an age where there are a lot of Christian celebrities deconstructing online. It's like, I don't believe the gospel anymore. They've gotten around some bad teaching. They've, they've allowed doubt to turn into unbelief. And guys, I want you to know you're in a church where doubt is welcome. I want you to doubt. If you doubt this morning, come back and doubt next week. Come back and doubt the week after. We wrestle with our doubt. You are listening to a pastor who regularly deals with doubt. Doubt is not a sin. Unbelief is the problem. Every one of us have had seasons of doubt, real struggle. Like, God, are you hearing me? God, are you real? God, are you going to do this? Paul says, my own friends have turned their back. Now, I want you to think for a second. Some of y'all are like, well, my friends who left the faith, they just had a bad pastor. They had Paul. Can we just take some responsibility and say, hey, if, if I'm going to make it in this thing called the Christian life, I'm going to have to do some of this myself and study the word, know the word, trust God. And then he goes on to put it this way. He says, verse 19, but God's firm foundation stands. We've talked about the foundation God has built. When they built foundations, they would often put a seal on it and there was a little stamp. In the temple, there was a stamp, a seal on the foundation. He says, but God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. The good news is this morning, you can fool me, you can fool your friend, you can fool your family. God knows if your heart is right. God knows if your heart is real. God knows if your desire is to love and serve him. And then, this is a twofold seal, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. God is serious about us repenting changing our mind about sin. This is what it looks like for God to use people. Because then he says in verse 20, now in the great house, we're, we're using this illustration he's built of a foundation. He says, now in the great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use and some for dishonorable. Guys, in the house of God, we would say we want to be vessels that God uses. We want to be used by God. The house is not what saves people. The house is not what serves people. When you go home today, we're grateful for the walls. We're grateful for the central heat. Amen, amen, right? But at the end of the day, it's not just the house and the walls. When you moved into your house, what did you do? You began putting things in there. You needed a bed. You need a sink. You need a faucet. You need a refrigerator. You need these things to survive and to thrive and to grow and to live. And the same is true of the house of God. We don't just need a building. We need people that God uses, vessels of honor, not just vessels of dishonor. The idea was there were wood vessels that they would tear up and use, and they were used often for meal making, and they would get thrown out. But then there were vessels of honor. They were made of silver and gold and brass. Why? Because they wanted them to last. They had lasting intrinsic value, and they were there to serve the household. So he says in verse 21, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Pastor Kevin already mentioned it. When we moved into Portsmouth, we knew we had a city that was in need. It was low income, high crime rate. This is a city that needs a church that is making good use of the people in the church, where good works are being performed, where there is good gospel ministry being done. There are addicts being freed from their addiction. There are not only people who love people, but love them enough to share the truth in the gospel with them and don't just preach at them but mentor them and meet with them on a regular basis and help them not only restore their marriage but see God move in their life. God has many good works he wants to do and he uses people. Not churches, people. Not buildings, people. He uses churches in the broad sense that it is God's people, but the church is the people of God. Guys, it is a miracle we're sitting here this morning. Don't, me, don't tell me God can't do it. Did you know that when we moved into this facility? I'm not sure if you're aware of this. There was a city code that allowed churches to meet in IL construction areas. That's what this is. It's IL, light industrial. There was only a little period of time where that was grandfathered in in the city of Portsmouth. So when we moved in here, we were allowed to meet here as a church. 
Every 10 years, the city changes that code. Do you know they changed that code in 2020? If we were to purchase this building today, we would not be allowed to meet here. It's just a change of city code. We happen to move into here at the right season, at the right moment. Not because God wanted to give us four walls. Because God had many good works that he wanted the vessels, the people of God to do in this city in his name. So it is not by accident that we're here. It's not by accident that God brought us to this passage. So I'm not going to read every verse for you, but I want you to know what we just said, basically. First of all, God needs us to allow God to change our attitude before he can use us. Mm-hmm. What were they doing? They were sitting around arguing about every little word. The issue wasn't the words. The issue was their attitude. And the reason they were that way was because that was the culture they lived in. People loved arguing. Did you know? <laughs> Funny thing about humans, nothing has changed. <laughs> oh, Pastor Mark, we have phones. What do you use them to do? <laughs> Keep telling me about how technology is going to change our lives. It just makes it easier to hate each other. Well, I know, it's not the, I'm not like saying throw your phone at It's not the phone's fault. It's us. Some of y'all are like, oh, he's right. Get rid of the phone. You're going to fight with your wife then. Like, we need to allow God to change our attitude, not culture. Too many of us are allowing culture to tell us what to be upset about, allowing culture to tell us what is most important in life instead of God, through his word, through his Holy Spirit, through his people. And if we're not allowing culture, we're allowing idols. Culture is the broad sense, what other people are upset about. Cult, idol is when I have decided this is what I worship. This is what matters. And if you mess with this, if you mess with my money, if you mess with my way of thinking, if you mess with my tribe, my people, man, I'm upset because this is what my life's about. And this is using you. That platform, that, them people, that tribe, they just want your stuff, your money, your momentum. They want your vote. They want your ideas. They want you. They don't want you. Here's how you can tell an idol from a God. God in heaven says he loves you, sends his son to die for you, offers free salvation, free grace. That's something a God would do. An idol says, give me your children. Sacrifice them on the altar. An idol says, don't worry what people think or say about you, pretending that they're gods. There's generic idols like fame and fortune. They'll chew you up and spit you out. And there's personalities who are idols. All they want is your money. All they want is you to back them. They don't know you, they'll never know you, and they could care less about you. Whereas God in his word says he knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows your days. He knows your long nights. He knows what you've been through. He knows what you'll go through. Knows you deeply and intimately and offers you grace and salvation in spite of the fact you've sinned, I've sinned, we've sinned in God's. Grace is still on the table as an offer. So allow God to change your attitude. I'm so frustrated with the church these days because we look just like the culture. We argue just like them. We're divisive just like them. Oh, you're not with us on this? You're not a real Christian. Your church, your church doesn't really take a stand on that issue? I guess your pastor's not really a pastor as if we know their church, as if we know their background, as if we know their community, as if we know anything about them. Where did we learn that? Not from God's word. No, no, we learned that from culture. And we're quick to call out cancel culture while we Christians do it to each other every day. This is our attitude. That's what he said in verse four, attitude, because here's the truth. I know a bunch of Christians who know how to handle God's word, but have the wrong attitude, and guess what? It lands flat. Every one of you work with somebody, know somebody, are full, angry, divisive, judgmental, or condescending. It's almost as if God knew we needed an attitude adjustment before we learned the word, because a lot of us learn the word without getting the attitude adjustment, and guess what that does? It hurts the hearers. It hurts 
those who seek God's word. This is personal. Guys, you need to spend time in God's word. You need to go to a small group. You need to get into God's word. And, and you say, Pastor Mark, you're always talking about small groups. Yeah, you want to know why? Because the real growth I've seen pe- take place in people's lives is not just when they come to church, get saved, and get baptized, and then, woohoo, they just free read God's word. Then in verses 16 through 18, he says, hey, don't believe everything you hear. Be careful, be careful of this babble that has led to people walking away from their faith and really denying Jesus is going to resurrect, like just nonsense stuff. Guys, if you're going to be careful, if you're going to really understand the gospel, you've got to study God's word so that you are not someone who believes everything you hear. There are a lot of baby Christians being discipled by bad teaching. And what we say is, oh, shame on those bad teachers. Okay, well, how about you start teaching? How about you open a small group? How about we stop saying it's the teacher's fault when it's us who are not knowing God's word, not teaching and preaching God's word. Oh, that I could help every believer in our church learn how to filter what they read and hear. Not, and let me rephrase that, not like me, but through the lens of Jesus. Would Jesus get this upset about this issue? Or am I being played right now? Would Jesus say, this is something I need to dedicate my life to? Or is this a, mm, is this a co-opting of the gospel in the name of politics, in the name of culture, in the name of, you fill in the blank. So allow God to change your attitude, study God's word, don't believe everything you hear, and then finally, practice repentance. What did he say? Those who call on the name of the Lord will depart from iniquity. Guys, the idea is not that you one time pray a prayer and say, God, I give you my life, and then you get up and live as if nothing changed. There is a daily repentance involved in being a Christian, and this is why the gospel is so hard, because the key to daily repentance is real humility. Acknowledging, I am still broken. I am still in need of salvation. I'm still in need. Not that you're not saved because you sinned. That's nonsense. It's the idea of, guess what? I'm a Christian. I screwed up. I got to repent again. I'm not getting saved again. I'm saying to God, God, I screwed up. I'm confessing because you already know, and I'm going to do my best. And some of y'all are frustrated like me. You're like, Pastor Mark, I've been repenting my whole life. Welcome to the Christian journey. (laughs) This is the tension of following Jesus in a fallen world. And some of you, if you're not careful, some of us, if we're not careful, we will allow that to break us. When this is grace, because the truth is it's good news. There's still more grace tomorrow when you mess up, when you fail. Uh, Practice repentance daily. You and I need to daily say, God, I've messed up. But when we get to the point where we're like, God, I'm good. That's not really a sin. I don't believe that's a sin. I don't believe this is a sin. Buddy, you are on a fast track to saying what you do doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I serve. You don't want God to use you because you've already decided you're God, not God. So if you want to be somebody that God uses, that's what it looks like. Know God's word. Let him change your attitude. Avoid bad teaching. Know the difference. Learn how to filter what you hear and what you read. And then practice repentance. This is what it looks like. Could I pray this morning for every believer to live that life? Jesus, I love you. I'm grateful for your church. I am grateful that we have so many lives in this room that have been changed through somebody sharing the gospel, somebody, Lord, praying for them for a long time, somebody reaching out to them and inviting them to a small group or to a church or just one-on-one witnessing to them. God, we love you. I pray right now that if there is anyone in the room that doesn't know you, that, God, they would humbly acknowledge they need a relationship with you. God, do what only you can through your Holy Spirit, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you look this way? I'm done preaching, but I'm not done praying. I'm going to tell you something. When I was 13, I prayed a prayer, and it forever changed my life. It required humility, repentance, and an acknowledging of God. If you're here this morning or you're watching online, you're saying, Pastor, I hear you, but I don't know God. I don't have a relationship with him. I'm not a saved, born-again Christian, whatever you want to call it. I'm not that, but I want that. I want you to know God's offer is always on the table, and it's a prayer away, an acknowledgement, saying, God, I'm ready. So if you'd like to do that this morning, I'm going to pray out loud like I do every Sunday at the end of every service. You never know who's in the room. There's some people in this room who prayed that prayer four years ago, five years ago. And when they told me there's a part of me, it's like, you never know. Will they be like that seed that's planted and it sprouts roots, but then it dies? Because the world chokes it out. But there are some here this morning who are thriving and alive because of one time they said, I'm going to trust this God. 
And then I'm going to follow him every step along the way. If you'd like to do that this morning, I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer in your heart. Your lips don't have to move. God knows your heart. Say, God, I know you're real and I need you. I'm ready to trust you. You sent Jesus. He died and rose for me. I need your grace. Help me trust you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Such a simple prayer, but all kinds of humility it requires. I'm going to ask everyone in the room to pull out their Connect card. And uh, some of you have already put your prayer request on there. If you're a guest, man, we're so glad that you're here. But if you are here this morning and you prayed that prayer, we want to know. Not just so we can give you a Bible, guys. We want to give you a nice Bible. If you don't have a Bible, I want everybody to have a Bible. But we want to know, we want you to know that heaven is celebrating. And it is very simple, but at the same time hard to follow Jesus. You need a church community around you. Say, Pastor Mark, I don't even live here. We will help you find a church wherever you live. We want to help you grow. So as you're filling out your Connect card this morning, however you need to, I've got some things I'm going to do to honor some people. Guys, this service is not going to go on forever. I'm coming down the home stretch. I promise. I promise. What I'm supposed to do right now is have the trustees come forward and uh, close the service. But before they do, um, I'm going to ask Kevin and Beth to come up. And I like it when Kevin's down here because I'm taller than him. So if you guys could come up here, that would be great. Um, give them a hand. Let me tell you a story, short story. Kevin lived in Ohio, and I called him every week for about two years. And I said, Kevin, I'm going to plant the church. And I really believe God's going to use you to be a part of it. I really believe it. I really believe God's got big plans for you. He's like, I'm not moving my kids and my family. I said, I know, but God said. <laughs> I never, look, I never guilty. Beth, I got to work on. <laughs> but no, they, they came on and helped raise funds, and they were part of that. There was nine adults, Kevin mentioned, or Travis mentioned. Travis one of those adults. Nine adults met in my living room to pray as we got started a few years ago. And Kevin and Beth have been faithful through it all, and, and look, if you've ever been in ministry, you know as a pastor sometimes you just deal with stuff you can't share. And so Kevin is constantly bearing up the weight. I get to preach. I get to be up front. I get to talk. I get to do all the fun stuff. Kevin is often in counseling, ke- counseling people. He is often, he needs counseling too. Like he, Kevin deals <laughs> with the frustrations. Yeah. You know, we're going to pray for healing. Let's get the deal. I know it's, we're short on time. No, we're not. We got one service. Um, <laughs> over the years, Kevin and Beth, they have four children. You know, they are faithful here. They get here early. Yesterday, Kevin and Beth were here with balloons. The balloon delivery didn't factor in. Blown up balloons take more room than unblown up. So the delivery driver was like, I'm going to have to make 11 trips. Wow. So Kevin and Beth got in their car, and they, they're just, they're those people. They're going to help however they can. Pastor appreciation, y'all give me stuff. When he's over here doing stuff, and y'all give him stuff too, but you, you always celebrate me. My son never had a need for his first year. Y'all gave us 7,000 wipes and 4,000 diapers. It's stupid. They got four kids, and y'all are like, here's a nickel to go get lunch at McDonald's with your four children. I hear there's free Mexican meals at the re- Mexican restaurant for children. So as in the role that they are, they rarely get celebrated and honored. So I wanted to do something really special. And so we reached out to their family. Um, Kevin and Beth love fishing. And so I said, Sue, what if we send them on a fishing trip? And Sue and I got to talking, and we were like, you know, there's a lot of places you can fish, but they've been wanting to go to Alaska for a long time. So they are going to Alaska for seven days. We've already organized it. They're going on a fishing trip, a whale watching trip. And here's the best part. We're not paying for their kids to go. They're staying here. Hey, we love these guys. I'm going to ask our trustees to come forward, and what we're going to do is we're going to pray over. These are our guys that keep us accountable financially. I'm going to ask the trustees and their wives to come forward to the front of the stage. These are our church, some of our church mothers and church fathers. Every one of our trustees and their wife serve in our church, and some of them serve in upfront areas. You'll see them in life track, right? Some of them serve behind the scenes. They're involved in benevolence. You guys can squeeze together. It's all right. And uh, some of them serve in kids' ministry. Some of them serve in student ministries. Nobody in front of you this morning is just like, hey, here's a figurehead at our church. They serve regularly behind the scenes in ways you would never know about. Over the, over the last six months, our church has been through a lot. We've had death. We've had hurt. We've had br- broken marriages. You name it. Things that we couldn't have survived 
in the first two or three years. But our roots are deeper and we have stronger leaders than we've ever had. And these, these individuals, as well as the small group leaders and team leaders in this house and the staff in this church, have walked through some dark nights with some people in ways that I, if I was the only one as your pastor, if it was just me and Kevin, we couldn't do. We are here as a body of believers. And these church, we're, we're praying for more church fathers and church mothers to step forward this year to love on the next generation because, guys, we're broken humans loving Jesus. And sometimes we need each other and we need a church mom, a church dad. So I'm gonna ask you to stand. I ask you to lift your hands. We're gonna pray over these leaders as well as every leader in our church that God would bless them. Why? Just so they feel better? No, because God is not finished building his church on this corner. We're also going to pray for our brothers and sisters over at Forward Church. Around the corner, Pastor Brian opened his church to us before we met in the, in the sports hall. That's where we met. We're praying for Jesus to build his church through everyday human beings. For God, I am nothing but an interim pastor in this life. Whether I'm here for the rest of my days, and that's 20 years or 75 years, one day. I will not be pastor of this church. It's yours. So God, we lift up the leaders in this place. We lift up the church fathers, the church mothers that love people, serve people, mentor people, meet with people, care for people. God, help us help people, not just so that they feel better, but God, you have many good works you've prepared for us to do in this city, in this community. Bless your church, Jesus. We're here. We are willing vessels. Use us as only you can. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen, guys. It's been good. It's been great. We'll see you next Sunday at 9, 30, and 11. If you have any prayer needs, there are staff and leaders in the hallway as well as up front that would love to pray with you. See you next week.